Hi, and welcome to another week of At Home Science with me, Leela, um, coming to you from the Fairbanks Museum, but obviously from home. Um, what I want to do is review what we, or what I saw this past week, and then go on to a possible um, project that you could do at home pretty easily. Um, so I want to share that out towards the end, but let me go ahead and first share my screen, and we'll go ahead and get started with some of the fun things hopefully that you're seeing out there as well. So first thing um, that I've been seeing is something called trout lily or dog tooth violet. So you'll notice it's got this really beautiful yellow uh, coloration. It's about four to 10 inches high, so you can really see it. They're um, solitary, so usually you just see one. Here's actually two near each other, but generally you see them sort of one at a time spaced out. Um, and they also have these really cool, large, broad leaves. There's just two of them, and it's, there's a big word they use with it, mottled. And so it's this coloration of sort of brownish red um, and green that you're seeing very easily. Uh, so again, you, you may see those leaves and you might not see the flower yet, but wherever those leaves are, you will definitely see this beautiful yellow flower. It's usually in woodlands or very sort of moist, um, wet areas is where you're going to see this trout lily, uh, which I just saw this past week. All right, and then another flower that on f this past Friday I got to see, which I was really excited about, is something called marsh marigold, but actually um, it looks more like a buttercup and it's actually in the buttercup family. Another name for it is cowslip, and it has these large waxy leaves. And actually, if you, if you um, looked at the stems, they would be hollow. And again, this lovely yellow flower, but this one, unlike our trout lily, which was sort of solitary or single ones, this one grows all together in sort of large colonies or groups. And it's in places that are incredibly wet, like marshland areas, um, ditches along the sides of roads, anywhere where there's water present. Um, and in this picture, you can sort of see there's water right here. And actually through here, you can see it's really muddy. Like if you stepped in that, it would go up to your knee at least. You know, you just would go right down through it and it would be very wet and muddy. So again, this is something that you'll see in those areas and it's definitely in bloom right now. Um, so our next flower, this one's a great favorite. It's called Bluet. It's this very small, delicate flower. Doesn't stand up very high, um, maybe like two or three inches. And again, a flower kind of like our cowslip or marsh marigold, it grows in these large colonies. You'll see lots of them covering a sort of a woodland area or um, in a field, um, even along the roads. But again, places where you're going to see a lot of that leaf litter, you're going to see these little bluets popping through um, and, and showing up. So the three flowers that we just looked at are all native flowers to this area. So these are all really beautiful things that you'll get to see um, definitely this week. But again, realize in the next, in the coming weeks, these flowers will disappear and others will start to appear. So these are ephemeral. They're here for a very short amount of time. So it's great to get out and find these flowers wherever you can. All right, and now on to our uh, one amphibian that I saw uh, is called a red eft newt, but this is actually, in, is, it's an Eastern newt, but this is in the juvenile or like a teenager. Um, so as a teenager, the newt actually leaves the pond that it was born in. It was aquatic as a larva, and then it leaves the pond and it gains this very bright red or orange coloration. And it begins for two to three years to walk, goes sort of on a long walkabout looking for a new pond. It wants to find a new place um, to find a mate, and raise babies there versus where it grew up. So the red F newt, one of the neat things about it is, and actually the eastern newt, so this is just that one stage, well, where we call it the red F newt, but it's actually an, uh, the eastern newt, is, uh, produces chemicals in its skin that help protect it. So this one being very brightly colored is basically advertising or telling everyone, go ahead, try to eat me, but it's gonna taste incredibly bad and you're gonna spit me out. 
And that's one of the reasons why the eastern newts do really well in water where fish are, because again, that toxicity or chemicals in their skin, fish don't want to have anything to do with them. So they survive very well in those ponds. But again, this was something that I just saw last week. Um, this one was crossing the road. Um, so it stood out really brightly. But again, they're, they're quite small, so you really have to look for them. Um, and as an adult, they're aquatic again, so they, they don't come out on land like this. They actually will have gills, and they'll be like an olive or brown. They're kind of a very dull color as compared to when they're a teenager or this red effed newt stage. All right, and then to, on to our reptile. So again, um, on a sunny day, I saw a, a, a sort of, I'm not sure if it's a male or female uh, garter snake, but I did see a large garter snake and it was on this rock and it started to move. My assumption is it was on the rock because the sun was out earlier and the rock warmed up. And of course, these guys being the same temperature as the air around them, in order for them to eat, they need to sort of warm up and get their metabolism going so that they can, you know, um, some of the things that they eat, like, worms, slugs, toads, salamanders, fish, tadpoles, probably not that eastern newt, right, because that that's chemical, has chemical toxins in it, but these other things, it has to warm up so that it can actually break down its food, so they may find a rock like this that's nice and warm, it may have been hiding near it, um, but just to show you it up close, I did, I was able to, again, gently to pick it up near the head, um, so you want to be careful, because anything, like we said last week, anything with a mouth can bite, but I just want you to see the coloration was really different on this one. Last week the baby was um, sort of brownish in color with stripes. This one was actually kind of a bluish gray um, and, and green, <laughs> had green stripes. And I just want you to really notice the eye. This is how you know it's not poisonous. It has a circular eye with a circular um, pupil in it. And, and something that is a you know, viper or poisonous generally will have more of a slit for the eye. So that's one way you know that this particular uh, garter snake, especially because if you're out in nature and you say, oh, garter snakes I thought were only brown, and this one sort of takes you by surprise and it's a different color. Again, if you get a good chance to look at that eye, you will realize that it is not um, poisonous or venomous, I should say. All right, so, and then what I realized is this weekend, <laughs> we had some very intense weather, um, you know, this sort of uh, much cooler air being brought down from the Arctic. So uh, many of you may have woken up to snow on Saturday and even had some snow on Sunday. And um, on days like that, where, you know, last week I was able to get outside and, and take pictures and see all of these really neat things, um, on days like this, though, where it's really chilly <laughs> and it's sort of, uh, you know, a big change or departure from the weather we've been having, I like to do puzzles. But you guys might, this might happen to you too, this puzzle was a little frustrating because it was actually missing a piece. And what I realized is even if you don't have puzzles at home, my hope is, so let me stop sharing my screen, um, my hope is that you can actually create your own puzzles. And so what I want to do again is I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to show you, this is one I already made, but I just took this out of a um, catalog and I just cut it into various different shapes and I'll show you how I made it. But basically just this idea that I could spread this all out and then if I wanted to start trying to figure out like how would I put, what shapes go together? Is this one of the ones, you know, just going through and trying to figure out how to reconstruct, ooh, it's like, it's a little harder than I thought, <laughs> um, how to sort of reconstruct this. This is actually a picture of two women um, petting goats. But what I'll do is, so this is just sort of the finished product, and this is what I would start to put together, but I'm going to push this over to the side because what I want to show you is I just took, you know, sort of any magazine that I found um, or catalog and I took a picture out, so I, I kind of like this one. This is somebody, um, hopefully we'll be having ice cream soon, <laughs> um, all together outdoors. And I took the picture and then I, I took a, um, a pen that's a little bit darker and you can draw any shape you want on it. But I just did kind of boxy shapes. The other one I did were squiggly or circly, but it's, they're um, curved and they're a little harder to cut. Whereas this one, hopefully because it's angled um, like boxes, 
might be easier. So another thing you'll need is you'll need scissors and then that page that you've pulled out of a magazine or um, a catalog. And again, ask your parents what you can take and what you can cut up. Um, there may be things that they are saving. So we don't want to just cut anything. But as soon as they give you the go ahead, go ahead and like I did, draw on it and then follow those lines. It kind of helps you. Whoops. And then this one, I'm going to just go ahead. I made lines down. So I'm going to just cut. And so then I start having these pieces that I can then build my puzzle from. So I'm going to do it again where I go across. And so I think, you know, if you're just beginning to cut, this is a simple way of just across, stop, and then up, stop, and then across, stop. And you could also, if you wanted to, you could leave really big puzzle pieces. You could cut smaller puzzle pieces like I just did here. But this idea that you can make your puzzle any level of difficulty or number of pieces that you want to, and you're in control of what the image is gonna you know, look like or how you're gonna cut out that image and put it back together. And so my hope is that making it is just as much fun as putting it back together. And I'll just show you, I'm gonna cut this one out and just show you, so if I left, you know, big pieces, I would look at these and think, oh, here we go. We've got a shirt coming together. Perfect, that works. And then I might look at this and think, hmm, we've got some, here's paper and paper. Oh, those must go together. And maybe that goes here. And then, oh, this is somebody's hand and it's pink, just like this. And so that idea that you start to make your image again once you cut it, but that you could do this over and over again. You could cut many different shapes out, many different um, pages out, and have fun making your own puzzle. Um, you could take you know, a photograph, uh, again, ask your parents, make sure, but the nice thing about a photograph is there's nothing on the back, so you know what side is front to back. If you're using something for a magazine, both sides are gonna have print on it, so you really have to keep one side up, but a photograph is nice because it will have that blank side, kind of like how a, a real puzzle has a blank back side. So again, hopefully really simple, you know, getting some sort of um, magazine, um, catalog, anything that comes in the mail that your parents are okay with you going through, rip a page out, um, grab both, you know, a pen. I was using a Sharpie, but you could use just a regular pen. Um, you could even potentially use a pencil. Try markers, anything that you have at home to draw on that page and making some sort of design, whether it's, you know, little boxes or swirls. And then gently using your scissors and being very careful with them, cutting out those shapes and eventually having fun rebuilding that same image that you started with, uh, but making as many puzzles as you want, especially for those really cold days like we just happen to have. So um, again, hopefully an easy and simple um, thing that you can do at home, uh, just with a few supplies that are, should be right at hand. And again, as soon as you can, getting back outside and really enjoying all those beautiful flowers and, and um, amphibians and reptiles that we're seeing, and hopefully we'll have more to share out next week. All right, well, have a great rest of your week and take care. Bye.